Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's uh, regional webinar session organized by the North American, Central America and Caribbean region. Um, as you know, we are uh, part of the we as, are part of the US Department of State network with 400 plus advising centers in 180 countries. And basically our objective is to promote studying in the US. So we offer free student advising on options to study in the US. And today we're going to bring more information to you about experiences from current students, past students who have studied in the US and are studying in the US on what you need to know when you arrive. So will you be ready um, when you arrive? Basically, we believe in five steps as part of the um, Education USA. So when you arrive, you, of course, when you're thinking of going to study in the US, research your options. Now that's step number one. Um, where do I want to study? Do I want to go cold where it's cold or do I prefer to go where in a warmer climate? Basically, that's the first step. Secondly, you need to look at how you're going to finance your study. So is there a scholarship available locally or are there other options at the university or college that you're looking at? So second, that's the second step. Third step is to look at how you are going to apply at your college of choice. Look at what's required, looking at that checklist, making sure that you're adhering to all of the points or requirements that they're um, presenting. And step number four, very important, is applying for your student visa. Um, and that's where we then prepare you for your departure once you have completed steps one through four. And um, I guess we are at step number five now, where we will hopefully um, enlighten you with the experiences of our students who will each introduce themselves as we continue. So we start with Isaac. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Isaac Rodriguez. I'm a current rising sophomore at Tufts University, and I'm doing a bachelor's in electrical engineering with a minor in environmental studies and policy. Thank you, Isaac. Hello, my name is Nereida. I'm from Guatemala, and I am currently a doctoral student in sociology at Texas A&M. A pleasure to be with all of you. Thank you, Nereida. Carlos? Hi, everyone. Thank you, Joanne, for having me. Um, I'm from El Salvador, and I'm a rising senior at Randolph Macon College in Ashland, Virginia, and I'm pursuing a bachelor's degree in business management and international commerce. Excellent. Thank you all so much for being here today and sharing your experiences with um, potential students visiting or um, going to study in the US in the near future. Um, so airport arrival, tell us what was your arrival to the US like? How is it going through immigration? Well, as a full rider, um, you will be granted with the J-1 visa and also a DS 2019. So you will have to have ready those two documents when you're arriving or you're going through immigration. Um, some of them are going to be very kind and some of them are going to uh, look tough, but um, just be prepared with the address of your future apartment and with your documents and everything will be all right. Thank you. Uh, Carlos, would you like to share? what it was like for you absolutely. absolutely my case i thought it was pretty smooth i you know i had all all of, all of my documents ready i had my passport my i-20 and all of the contact information from my uh university so um as scenario that said um you know some of them are pretty tough um some of them are just gonna ask you a couple of questions and they're gonna look at your documents but if you have everything in order they're just gonna let you in um but yeah you just have to be ready um and and of course it's you know you can get a little bit nervous especially if it's the first time you're coming to the united states um and and um you know they're gonna look at your background and 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 um but it overall in at least in my personal experience it was very smooth it was very smooth 
Okay, thank you, Carlos. Um, although um, we would usually ask two questions, but Isaac, I saw you nodding heavily. So is there something that you would like to share from your first experience? Yeah, in my case, it was like my first time entering the country last year. And I was pretty nervous about that moment because I thought that it was going to be like a really tough person. Like it was going to be like a, um, like a lot of questions like that. But honestly, I brought like a lot of papers. And at the end, the only paper that they asked me for was the I-20, uh, my visa document. Other documents that I would recommend maybe to bring are like your admission letter and also like financial document that show how you're gonna pay like that academic year. And also all the contact information such as the address and like phone number or someone that you can call once you um, arrive to, to the college. Thank you so much for sharing that. Okay, um, in terms of budgeting now, um, maybe um, Isaac and Nereida can answer this. Sure. What do you recommend uh, regarding living on a student budget? So I consider that regarding budget, it really differs from undergrad to graduate student because like as an undergrad, you have like literally like everything there at college, like you take food from the dining halls, um, you do like your laundry in your resident hall, you do like, um, you have like your, own housing assignment where it includes like basically like the the space and the needs that that you're gonna need to serve your desk your um your bed all the all that stuff so there's there are like a really huge difference as you are not going to be worrying specifically in the in the housing part um, but what I would recommend is to is to maybe like organize every time you like to bend more to your friends because that's something that you do like really frequently when you hang out with your friends and also um well this depends also on the place that you live but for example like take um take like for example like the student discounts like in my case i have like an student discount to use the mta that is like the like the subway in boston so that's something that you should also can take advantage of. Um, and yeah, that's that's pretty much how, how it is for, for our undergrad. Thank you, Isaac, for making the distinction. Yeah, for a graduate student, it's very different. Um, and, and for me, it was even, even like, let's say, harder to budget because I am married. So as a married full rider, uh, in terms of housing, um, 60% of my budget was housing because, you know, you, you need to find a one bedroom, one, one bedroom, one be bathroom apartment. Uh, so you can have some privacy and, but for a single person, uh, and let's say a graduate student, it might be 30% of your budget. Um, what I did for food is that as in Guatemala, we have fresh vegetables and fruits and everything um, is fresh. I try to continue with that type of diet. And maybe during the week, I spend $50 a week in all of this, uh, but I'm in Texas. So it's a state where things are cheaper than in other states. So that also depends from state to state, um, the budget that you're going to use whether to whether for housing and for food. And the other thing that I would say is that set aside an emergency fund, like maybe $200, just because uh, in my case, there was a time where I had to pay some fees to the university, even though I had a scholarship, I had to do that deposit. So it was good to have that emergency fund. So yeah, I would recommend that. Excellent, thank you, Isaac and Nereida. The following question, what can you tell us about Venmo and other money sending platforms, Carlos? Uh, absolutely, well, I've used Venmo before, but there are also other uh, applications that are um, offered through uh, your bank account. When, when you come to the US and you, know, you open a bank account, you usually get 
Um, if you're under the age of 24, you usually get a free bank account. Um, so this banks for, let's say, for example, I don't know, Bank of America or Wells Fargo, um, they offer, they in their app, they have this uh, feature uh, through which you can send money uh, to other people. Um, so that's, that's really helpful. Uh, Venmo is very common, uh, but you need to have a bank, an American bank account uh, before you can uh, set up Venmo. Um, so when you're, when, at least when I arrived, uh, you know, when I had to pay, when, you know, went out for lunch with friends and then, you know, we, we, we decided to like split the bill or something. They were like, oh, can you Venmo me? Um, I was like, I don't know what Venmo is. <laughs> so, so it took some time for me to, you know, adapt and like, uh, learn what, what resources people here, here have and use. Um, so, uh, yeah, so that, that's one. That's Venmo. Uh, Cash App is another one that's very common. Um, you can also buy cryptocurrencies there like Bitcoin. Um, and, and yeah, I don't know if the guys have any, anything else in mind. Go ahead, Isaac or Nared, if you have anything to add. Oh, well, I was just going to add about Cash App. That is something that I also use. But like with Venmo, actually, um, well, I have Venmo and something that it's like a cool feature, I feel like uh, for Venmo is that now you can, well, in my case, I have paid with Venmo in a lot of places, just, just using like a Q QR code. So sometimes like, I remember like sometimes I just go out of my, of my room just with my phone and I don't need even like my wallet because I can pay with Venmo and that's something like really cool about it. Yeah, exactly. Like there was a time, at least last semester, in which I never used cash. I had my wallet and I had two dollar bills. I had those two dollar bills for like five months because I never, I never used, I never used cash. Um, you know, in my in my school, they often host this thing they call late night bus. So like during the weekends, uh, they start this social events at around like one a.m. Um, and it's organized by the school, and you know they sometimes sell different things or different. Uh, clubs um, have like food or something, um, but they never, like you never use cash. Like, you, you know, there's this small little business and they're like, oh, we only accept Venmo. <laughs> so it's one of the things you, you get to um, learn how to use when you get here. Thank you both for the um, informative sharing of that information. Um, what are some of the things you brought from home versus waited to buy in the US? So what, what's an absolute must versus, oh, I can get that here. Um, go ahead. I think that a, an absolute must is a SIM free phone. So you can actually like um, get a phone plan or any other college student friendly, um packages for your phone but definitely just having your uh your phone liberated to use it with any company here in the states is a must isaac or carlos anything to add to that yeah some of the basic things that I brought from home was definitely food <laughs> because there are obviously like some Costa Rican food that I kind of get in the US. So that was something like 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 a must on my, on my luggage. And something that I waited to buy in the US was actually like a personal computer because uh, before starting college, I did not have like, um, like a really good one. So I decided to wait until I arrived to the US because um, actually you get like a lot of discounts with the, with the student ID and with your like uh, institutional email. So like, for example, there is this um, app that is called Unidays in which with just like your um, institutional email, you can log in and you will get like a lot or a lot of discounts. So that was something that I preferred to wait until I write to the US because it was going to be cheaper. Okay, was that uni days, U-N-I-D-A-Y-S? Yeah, okay. Uh, Carlos, anything uh, that you might add to that list? Yeah, I was just gonna go back to the things I brought. I didn't bring much from home. I sort of waited to get here to buy, let's say like technology, like phone or like a computer. Um, Cause I knew that in college, you know, I was gonna take all those 
uh, difficult courses that would require, uh, you know, a computer with a better um, processor. So <laughs> I would, but some of the things I brought were mostly souvenirs or things that I just, I knew that I was not going to be able to find here in the U.S. Like I remember bringing uh, like postcards and like tiny Salvadorian flags, uh, you know, for, for the friends I knew I was going to make here. Um, well, I came pretty confident. I was really, you know, I, I, I thought, well, I'm going to be there for four years. I better make friends. Um, <laughs> so giving someone, a, you know, a tiny little piece of, I don't know, a, something as simple as a pen, you know, uh, or um, ah, what else? Um, well, just, just souvenirs in general. Um, just just bring bring some, I would, I would suggest. Yeah, and I think that I would add that it is not necessary to bring a lot of clothes just because whenever you come back to your home you just have to get rid of a lot of things because usually in the states you're going to buy things so um there are pretty good stores where you can find winter clothes like marshalls or or ross that that they're cheap and good quality and it can fit your budget yeah and also there are a lot of secondhand shops all over the place. I, I love Goodwill because I always find, you know, very, uh, like very decent clothes for like two, three dollars. So like if you're a student, I mean, just in general, it's more, it's, you know, environment, it's more environmentally friendly to, you know, buy um, uh, secondhand um, stuff. But, uh, but also just going back to the budget and thing, it, it's just a lot cheaper. Um, I think, you know, well, if you're, of course, it depends on your interest, but um, that's something I personally like. Excellent. Thank you. Circular economy, Carlos. Right. OK, thank you very much for that. And just a reminder to the audience, if you were not seeing a question that you have, send out your questions. If you're on Zoom, send it out to Kira. If you're on Facebook, send it out to Elvira. And um, we'll make sure to answer those questions at the end of the session. Um, health insurance and phone plans. So what do you wish you had known about US health insurance? Carlos, Isaac, um, let us know. It's expensive. <laughs> uh, I think, uh, well, it depends on your scholarship and what program you're uh, participating in. Uh, but as a as an international student uh, on an F1 visa, at least my scholarship gave me, you know, cover everything. Well, they covered um, tuition, room and board, but there were uh, some expenses that I had to um, either get personal funds and that I also and some and also um, some that I had to get, you know, funding from from, from different sources and education. You say was one of the uh ones that you know provided me with a lot of help in this uh particular situation um because at least in at, in my school just for one year uh health insurance is about two thousand seven uh two thousand three hundred dollars um and that's and that covers eighty percent uh, of anything uh it, it never covers you, you you know you always have those co-pays those deductible that you know there's a lot of Ter terminology there that it's new when, when you come to the to, to the US uh, um, but I think you can all what you can't always rely on health insurance uh, I think it's always important to have that emergency um, uh, like some dollars you know uh, in case uh, anything happens because just the trip to the emergency room would cost uh, around 300 uh, Three thousand five hundred dollars, um, and if you have health insurance, yes, it might cover up to eighty percent, but that still means you have to pay um, quite a bit. Um, so it's the health insurance world. It's a pretty, um, it's it's pretty difficult to navigate, uh, particularly in the United States, and that's something that uh, you know you kind of just learn as you go. Uh, <laughs> okay, thank you, Isaac. Uh, yeah, like health in general is like pretty expensive, pretty expensive in the US. 
Um, however, something that I try to get advantage of is that, well, for example, I check on my benefits that my health insurer included. And in that way, um, I remember like on February, like when, as soon as the spring semester started, I was checking on the benefits and I realized that I have like um, physical exams and general exams, like blood tests and all that, that were counted as free. So, well, in my case, actually, I decided to took uh, advantage of those benefits, just like to, you know, like to have like more control of your health and like to be like more sure of, of, of your health in general. And that's something that I would like completely like recommend to, to get to know well, like, as soon as you start like your academic year, like your insurance is gonna send you like an information. For ex they are gonna send you the, um, the insurance card. I always have it like in my phone. I just have like an screenshot of it. So um, just in case I have any, uh, like an emergency or something like that, I can just pull up that information and all my information will be there. So that's super important to, to have like really, um, like in a really like close to you space um what else um but yeah like honestly i haven't had to use uh like my health insurance for any emergencies so i don't know how it would be like you know like you know like an ambulance and all that but i know that that's pretty expensive um and yeah that would be thank you isaac um another question that we have for you. What kind of phone plan do you have and how did you choose it? Nereida and Carlos, maybe? Well, at the very, very beginning, um, what I did was that, well, I got the Mint plan. It's M-I-N-T. It's something that you don't need to have a credit score or or whatsoever. It's just that you can you can just buy the SIM card and they're going to mail mail it to you and then you're gonna be good to go. Then what I did or what well one of some of our friends did um it's that when you already know people you can go into phone plans all together so let's say a family plan that it's like i don't know a hundred dollars a month so everyone pays 25 dollars each month so something like that and another thing that it's uh, feasible if you have family in the united states they can add you to their phone plans that's something that we did because we have i had my in-laws here so i that was how well, that's how I was able to get into Sprint or even into at and So those are like three ways that I can think of. Thank you, Nereida, very helpful. Um, Carlos? Yeah, I, I actually got, you know, I, when I came in, I spent, I think my first semester without an American phone number because uh, I was always on campus um, so I always had, you know, access, I, had, I was always connected to Wi-Fi um, and I mostly communicated with friends uh, through Snapchat or WhatsApp or, or iMessage. Um, so it was only when, you know, I went to the city that I needed to use, I don't know, Google Maps or call an Uber. Um, so after a while, I came across this plan that's just like $20 a month. Um, and you get like two gigabytes of data each month. Um, and the, it's it's called H, H2 H Wireless and they work under the um, AT&T network. And it's worked um, pretty well for me so far. And yeah, I'm still using it. Excellent, thank you, Carlos. Um, another question. What kind of platforms do you use to talk with your US-based contacts? I message actually. And, and they try to get WhatsApp because of international friends, but they usually use iMessage and maybe Instagram at some like sometimes, but like yes, iMessage is the 
um, is a platform where you can communicate with your US or your American friends. Isaac? Yeah, it's the same platform. I'm just using side measures to communicate with my friends. Uh, and some platform that I had like a lot of time without using here was a Snapchat. But as soon as I arrived on campus, I realized that everyone was using a Snapchat. So I don't like it again. Um, and yeah, so like sometimes I use a Snapchat, but mostly I message for everything. Okay, thank you so much. Um, now we have about making plans, right? Everybody makes plans. How is socializing and making plans with friends different in the US than in your um, each of your particular countries? Oh, some Americans are there. Um, so something that I used to do is that um, when making plans, I did not, I was not the one who was like offering ideas. I was just like joining the ideas at, at the start of the semester. So it was easier to me to just say like, yeah, I can go instead of saying, okay, let's go. Um, so that's um, something like, like that I used to do like with my friends when the semester started. Like at first it was like pretty difficult because everyone was like doing quarantine and all that because of the COVID-19 situation. But it was pretty easy to to make friends with the people that live in the same residence hall because like everyone lives in, in the college so everyone lives in the residence halls so like you know you make friends in the in the common rooms you make friends like even in the laundry room you make friends like every in every place in your building so it is like pretty easy like to like to start making friends there and regarding making plans it's always like you know, just like a message like, hey, let's go to eat, like, you know, let's go to your ramen in this place in Cambridge. So you just go like, yeah, and then you just found out like everyone in the place and it's pretty easy. Okay, thank you. Nereida. I think that's something different for me. Uh, it was that in Guatemala, I only had Guatemalan friends, but coming to the United States, I mean, you have friends, friends from a lot of backgrounds and cultural backgrounds, different languages, but all of us communicate in English. But the good thing is that you get to know their cultures, you get to know like what, what they like, what they think. And another thing that I found interesting, um, I am in College Station, which, which is a college town. So I found that, I found very easily to, to get to know groups and that share i don't know maybe if you're a christian so you can read bible together or if if you want to get to know more if you're an indian student and you want to go to the indian association there is an indian association and all of that groups where you can find community there are a lot of that so um that's amazing here and I think that that's something that it's very valuable because once you get to know all these people, like for, for me from Georgia, Azerbaijan, South Korea, and when they come back to their countries, you know that you have friends there and whenever you want, you just can go and visit them. And, and just, it, it, gave, it gives you this sense that actually the world becomes smaller that you can go wherever and you will have friends there. So it's pretty special. Nice, really nice. Carlos, you wanna share anything? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think one of the things that are different is the fact that it's a lot, I, I, well, at least that's what I think, it's a lot easier to make plans because since you live on campus, you see people all the time. Like you go, you know, you can just uh, make plans to like get dinner together. If you, you guys, might live in the same uh, floor, or the same residence, or the same building. Um, so uh, there's a lot of room for spontaneity and and and, and this and just building up on what Nareda said about how diverse the student bodies are. Um, you know, one of my closest friends is from Pakistan. The other one's from Nepal. I'm from El Salvador. That's literally, you know across the entire world <laughs> uh, and, and it's great to you know establish those relationships with people um, uh, last semester we had an exchange student from well like three semesters ago we had an exchange student from South Korea 
um, I'm this I'm, this semester, this fall, I'm I'm traveling to South Korea for for a semester. I'm doing a semester abroad, and this friend who came to visit uh, or who came to spend a semester, he's gonna come pick me up at the airport. Uh, it's just great to know that you know I had that one friend that I'm going to South Korea and that he's gonna be there. <laughs> Wonderful, wonderful. Um, thank you for sharing that, um, um, all of you, actually. And um, now the more serious parts of the questions. How did you file your taxes as an international student? Also, basically, uh, as an undergrad, like there is, us, there is always gonna be like an international center or like someone in charge of the international students that is gonna be reminding you and like trying to help you with that. But normally we use like third party platforms to fill out the taxes. So for example, in my case, we filled out, we have to fill them out with a sprint tax. And basically the only thing that, um, well, the only thing that I needed to fill out the taxes was either a social security number or ITN. The social security number you're gonna get it just if you work and the ITN is if you do not work. So something that I will highly recommend is to get maybe like a job on campus to get a social security number because sometimes, well, just sometimes like the ITN process can be um, a little bit uh, longer. So for example, in my case, I filed out taxes but did not fill it up on time. Nothing happened fortunately, but I did not fill it up on time because I didn't have uh, for the deadline the social security number or the ITN and I have it until days after that so like that's something that you should like take in account like by the deadline you should have at least one of those two numbers the social security number or the itn excellent thank you isaac um anyone else wants to add to that carlos yeah, yeah sure um as as isaac said your designated school official is going to constantly, constantly remind you that you have to file taxes. Even if you're not making any income, you have to file taxes. And as an F1, or as what they call us, um, non-resident aliens for tax purposes, we have to mail our taxes. Um, because US citizens can use TurboTax, uh, you know, you know, it's every, everything's filed electronically, but we have to print out the forms, sign it, and mail it so you have to go like physically go to the usps office and or ups or whatever you choose uh, and you have to mail it um so that's you know like an extra step but there's you know nowadays there's a lot of different software that you can use um to make sure that you're um filing everything correctly like down to the penny um and and in my case my university is provides us access provides us with access to um, uh, GTP which is the software we use um, we get a form from our business office or our accounting office um, if, if you're working you get a w2 uh, and then you just add that on the on the software and then it tells you whether you're um, gonna have to pay taxes or whether you're getting a refund um, so there, there is software and that makes it a lot easier. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that information, Carlos, as well. Um, with, you know, with the pandemic and everything, uh, mental health has become something more, more uh, visible. What types of services does your university offer for students in terms of mental health that you're aware of? Well, in my case, I actually uh, did use of counseling. So when the spring semester started, I felt like, um, well, it was more difficult than the fall semester. Well, my second semester, I was taking more hard classes. I was taking more classes and I was taking, you know, already I was going to start like with classes regarding my major. So I started feeling like a lot of feeling like a lot of pressure um, regarding, you know, like um, having good grades, but passing all the passing all the classes and all that. So I decided to go to counseling and it was pretty easy to get there. They, I just literally sent an email and it was like, okay, let's see, let's solve tomorrow. And it was super, super easy to get um, those services. They were free by, by the institution. I guess that that probably will change 
institution by institution. Um, some of them, uh, they told me that some of them actually asked like the student to have like, to, to have like these services covered by the health insurance. But again, in my case, that was not um, the case. It was just like a, like a, like a free mental health service. So yeah, and it was like super accessible and I highly recommend it because taking care of your mental health is super important and it's something that can help you to go through the semester. Excellent, thank you, Nereida. I think, thank you. I think that another thing that the university did here was to move everything little by little to an online version. So for instance, workout sessions, and I kind of use working out to stress relieving or like just to have a good mental health. That's very, it's very useful to me. So having those virtual sessions were really helpful. And in general, gym facilities are pretty good in, in our university. So just take advantage of that. Um, take a time for yourself to make some exercise, to work out and to like focus your mind in, in something else that it's not just a studying and maybe just working out by yourself or with a friend, it's gonna be helpful to you and it's gonna give you the motivation that you need to continue studying because sometimes it can, it, it can get very tough during the semester, but things like that are, you, are, are actually very helpful. Thank you so much, both of you, for sharing um, that very important part um, now. Now, this is an open question to all three of you. Um, so we can do uh, Carlos, Nereida, and Isaac. What other things do you wish you had known before arriving to the US? So something that you, know, you completely did not think um, about. What, what did you wish you had known, Carlos? Yeah, you know, I think you can never be prepared enough uh, for anything. So I think it's, I think I would suggest that you come with an open mind with, um, you know, you can just expect anything because, you know, sometimes just thing ha things happen and it's just important sometimes to make terms with things sometimes, um, to come to terms with things sometimes, just, you know, um, I know Isaac, for example, he wasn't expecting to start his uh, college education online, uh, especially I can imagine how difficult it was during the first year. Um, so uh, one of the things, one of the skills that you really develop uh, through international education, I feel, is that ability to adapt to changing environments. So I would suggest that you just um, come with an open mind. And another thing is, uh, one of the things I wish I, <laughs> I had told, I had known before is that it's it's okay to have an accent. Uh, you know, I, before coming here, I felt so pressured to, oh, I have to sound like a native speaker. What are people gonna say? Um, no, <laughs> it's it's okay. Like what, really, when you come here and, and and you interact with other international students, um, you realize that you you. You're not alone that you know uh, you're not the only one adapting to a new country to a new language the fact that you put yourself through uh, the time and effort to learn a second language and the fact that you're now at, at an institution institution of higher learning in the united states it's a great achievement um so uh, just don't be too hard on yourself excellent thank you nereida thank you uh, I wish I had known more about the professor and student relationship here in the States. I think that it is a rule and not an exception that professor wants you to be successful and that they really want to help you in your professional goals. So just by the fact that you are coming to the United States, it says a lot about you, that you're a hard worker, that you are really good uh, studying, but you have to go further, like you have to go further in your relationship building skills. And not only with your classmates who are going to be your future network, but also with your professors. 
Um, so you attend a class, you sit down there, but after like two or three classes, you can email your professor or you can go to their office hours. Like just talk about a, a topic that you really like about the class or a topic that you have some doubts about it. You just have to have a topic of like a nice breaker so they can get to know you even more. And I was impressed to notice that, for instance, I said, oh, so professor, I, I really want to do an internship at UNICEF. And the professor was, you know what? I have a contact in UNICEF. So of course you're going to go through all the internship process, but just getting a conversation with someone like uh, how an intern day-to-day uh, -day look like. So that approach, the professors can get you those type of contacts. And, and so I shared that and it was pretty amazing because of COVID, I didn't get it, um, unfortunately, but that kind of things. Another thing that it was pretty awesome, it was that I really wanted to continue my doctoral degree. And I, uh, and I shared it with a professor in a, and this professor connected me with different professors in different universities that were matching interests, interests with me. So that made the application and admission process smoother. Um, the other thing I would say is that, uh, go for, go and have a cup of coffee or a lunch with your professor. Maybe you don't feel comfortable doing it alone. So maybe you can like set a gather, uh, like a meeting with your classmates. So all of you can go and have like a more informal conversation. It will really nourish you personally and professionally. Um, so I would say just to overcome those barriers of shyness, um, some of us are, sh some of us are shy, some of us are outgoing, but just overcome it. And, and they already, they already know that you're very, you're a hardworking student, but, but just to get to know them more, uh, it's going to be very valuable for you. Thank you, Nereida. Isaac. How about you? What did you wish you had known? Yeah, just to add as Nere, um as Nereda said, like I will I will, I wish I could have known more about like the professor student relationship. Because again, like professors here in the in the US are pretty approachable. Like you can ask them any question regarding like the topic, like and they are always gonna be willing to help you and to assist you with um not again not only academic questions but like you know like getting an internship getting like a getting like an assistantship in a laboratory or, and things like that so that's something that i would like to have known before for example like um the intro to engineering class that i took last semester um at first i was like a little shy with my professor and i did not like a lot of questions but then i started making more questions because i was really interested in the class in general and this semester the professor like decided to be my academic advisor so now he's like the one who is in charge of all my academic process to to college and another example is for example my my english professor to choose to choose to invite us to you know just to have like a small meetings like at the cafe to talk about the essays to call to talk about like how we grad the essays and to also get to know each other so that was something that i could not imagine before like about like coming to the s that the relationship with the professor would be like so like something like so like so close something um something else that i wish i could have known before is about like how like classes are like distributed and how classes are like um, managed. Um, for example, in my case, like I thought that it was going to be, you know, just enrolling in courses and going to classes like, like a normal college student. But, you know, classes normally have lectures. They also have recitations. They also have laboratories. They also have office hours. And so it really changed a lot. Like you can go to office hours and you can be also to teaching assistant hours. So there is a lot of options. For example, I remember like um, my first recitation that was in person, I thought that it was going to be like, you know, I have to take like a lot of, uh, like, you know, I have to take like my notebook. I have to get ready to start taking notes. I have to maybe do like, um, 
to be super ready, super ready with my readings and stuff like that. And actually, my presentation was just like a, you know, like a table meeting. Um, like we were just talking about what we discussed in the lecture and we were just discussing and it was pretty chill and that was something that I did not thought about before and then like for example like office hours I thought that office hours were going to be like you know something like I was nervous the first time I attended like an office hours I remember like it was for uh, for this engineering class and I was like but it's just one question. What if what if the professor is gonna be like, did you come here just for one question? And no, actually, it was like super easy to just sit um, sit there and making the question. And he took the time to explain me everything. So that's something that that I wish I could have known before because if I knew it before, I probably would have said like since since the start of the semesters, I would be like more like accommodated to that academic environment. So yeah. Wow, thank you all for your great input. I, I believe our um, future students are taking notes and um, making sure that um, they, they make use of this information. If you have any questions um, now from um, other students that have joined us today, um, please send them on either the Zoom chat to Kira or to Elvira on the Facebook page. If you have any questions, um, please let us know and we can have our students respond to these questions. And if they're not able to, then we have um, advisors that are able to um, assist you with these questions. So go ahead. Um, oh, here's one question. Aha, this is a nice one. How did you handle your first winter after coming from a place with a tropical climate? Um. I still remember like the first time it snowed, it was like, uh, I was like, I don't know, it was so funny. I just opened the window and everything was white and I was like, oh my gosh. And I was so nervous to go in outside and something that I would get in advice from the first, um, from the first snow is that I got my winter jacket like, like two or three weeks um, after it started to snow and actually that was the worst idea because like you know when the when it started to snow I was always wearing hoodies and I was always wearing just like normal jackets and those normally get wet so easy and then you are like cold like the whole day so like that's something that you should know um you should get like your winter jacket before it starts to snow um because actually even before it starts to snow like the weather is pretty um it's pretty cold so like you should you should take that in account like you know also get gloves you also get like a beanie um like regarding shoes maybe not wearing like converse and stuff like that because they get wet so easy in the snow um i used to get i prefer to go out in like you know like normal well not normal shoes but like leather shoes because those were better like like you know waterproof and all that so, and obviously it's not like you're gonna be out like in shorts because also like for example um something that, that i remember is that one day it was a snow is super super hard college and i was coming from the library and i and i saw this friend that was like through the um close to the jumbo statue in my my college and he was there and he was hey do you want to go a slide there in the in the you know in like in the hill and you know if i were like in a short if i were not like in like clothes for winter i could not have a slide through the hill in the in the snow and also i remember like it was super random and then we ended up doing like a snowman so like you should be prepared for like for those for those things and kind of events nice very nice uh carlos nereida any any tips for for um dealing with that first winter Fortunately for me, I'm in Texas, so the winters are not as bad as in the north. Um, I think that it just gets very cold and you need a really good jacket. And as I said before, there are, and, and I'm going to copy the, the, uh, the tip that Carlos said, you can go to a Goodwill or you can go to Marshalls and Rolls and get a really good jacket and good boots I said uh, I would say um, and yeah in Texas is not as bad as in the north so um, I'm I'm very privileged because of that but the heat the heat is 
almost unbearable. But yeah. Okay, um, Carlos, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to the next questions because we have a list from um, as well. Um, maybe you can answer this one: Is the pandemic affecting the exchange programs that you're? Um, do you know that? Yes. Um, well, at least my school during the first I think most exchanges were canceled in the first um, semester, like when last year when the pandemic started. Um, but then last, not this semester, this spring, um, we had we had we had quite a few exchange students coming in, um, and and I myself, <laughs> I spent a semester abroad in Germany during fall, not during spring twenty twenty, so, so right right when the pandemic started. Uh, but fortunately, I was able to stay there, um, and I was provided with all the necessary resources to um, stay safe. I had access to, you know, a good health plan, uh, you know, in case anything happened. Um, and um, all in all, well, well, most classes are and were and are, and are still online, um, you know, with the Delta variant spreading, uh, more restrictions are being put back into place. Um, so at least my school is still waiting on new instructions for the upcoming fall. The plan was to have in-person classes um, again, but it, it looks like we might be starting online. Um, but as far as exchange programs go, they're still happening. Uh, student, but students are just gonna be required, you know, more uh, like social distancing and, and um, face coverings and all those measures we're all familiar with at this point. <laughs> oh, you're muted. Joanne, you're muted. Thank you, Isaac. Um, another question, for things to bring from home, what about stuff for cooking or for your bed? No. <laughs> you I personally uh, did not bring any of that because uh, if if you're if you're gonna come to a university, there's gonna be a cafeteria, um, so you might not even need to cook. Um, in the dorms, in the student dorms, generally, the you don't really have access to a kitchen. Uh, at least, in, at least in my university, it's only like the senior apartments or or um special interest housing that you know have access to that um and then bedding and all of that like you can always go to walmart here and it's affordable or target if you're a target person um so it's it, yeah i think it's very affordable and like you would just add more space to your suitcase uh it would take space from your suitcase i mean <laughs> and it would add weight uh but yeah that's what i think Okay, thank you. Nereida, you wanted to add something? Yeah, uh, well, I don't know if it happened to both of you, Isaac or Carlos, but well, it's just that I'm a graduate student, so it might be different. But the thing is that in college, college station, so if you're coming to Texas A&M and you're coming to college station, um, there are furniture giveaways. So churches organize themselves and give furniture for free. So if you have an unfurnished apartment, you can get everything from, from the furniture giveaway. You can get pans, you can get even forks, um, everything, everything. Um, it's pretty amazing the work that they do here. So, but this information is shared by the university usually. So you might find out or you might, yeah, find out if there is something like that in the in the town that you're going, and if not, as I would just uh, say the same as Carlos said, that don't don't bother to bring pants or things that just will take place from your suitcase. You can buy it very cheap in Walmart. Oh, 
Excellent. Thank you. Um, and we all love Target, Carlos. Um, a, a question for Nereida. Thank you for being here with us today and for sharing your knowledge and experience. Are you currently doing a bachelor's or a master's degree and under which scholarship are you studying in the US? Thank you so much for the question. Well, I came here two years ago with the Fulbright scholarship uh, to study my master in international affairs at Texas A&M but I extended my stay by applying to a doctoral program in which I also had a full scholarship. So I'm gonna be here for five more years. I'm excited about uh, keep learning and keep getting into research and all of that. So yes, I'm doing that right now. Thank you. Um... It has another question. What is the best time to arrive in the US before school starts? Isaac or Carlos? Yeah, so basically like the school's gonna give you like a well, as an undergrad, the school is gonna give you like a day to arrive specifically. And it's like the day that they are gonna open the dorms and that they are gonna do like all the um, welcoming process that normally is during orientation that happens always before classes start as a freshman. Then like the incoming years, sophomore and junior and senior, you normally just arrive like when they tell you like, okay, this is like coming day for, for you all to move into your dorms. So yeah, that will be normally, well, that depends on also on the school. So like, well, in my case is also late, is normally late August and I will, like in my case, what I did is that I bought my ticket for for college the same day, so I will arrive the same day that I will not have to be looking like maybe to say like in a in a hotel the day before or like to to move that. So yeah. Joanne, you're muted. Did you have anything to add, Carlos? No. No, not much. I just, as I as like said, it, it really depends on your school and your plans because on an F1 visa, I think you can enter the country uh, four weeks prior to the start of your program. So if you have, I don't know, in my case, let's say I'm in Virginia, maybe my school started on September 1st, but I had family, let's say, um, in Pennsylvania, I could have maybe gone there for two weeks before. Or, or three weeks, but um, just, you know, you have to make sure that you're traveling within that time frame. Because um, if you come like a, a month prior to the start of your program, they're not gonna let you in basically. Um, so, and then also like you can't move in, um, like your school's gonna say, you have to be on campus on August 25th 25th and sometimes they're going to be very strict about it um, and, uh, and during your first year they might come pick you up to the airport it really depends on your school um, if not you might need to uh, navigate the public transport transportation system to get there um, but again it, it, it depends on, on, on a university okay thank you very much um, Isa, Carlos and Nereida for being with us here today. It was an honor to have you as a panel and I'm sure everyone um, learned a lot from what you had to share. Um, in terms of the questions that did not get answered here today, please reach out to your nearest advising center. Um, you can look at the link below, go to educationusa.state.gov and then you can find your nearest um, advising center to answer all of your questions. And once again, thank you for joining us. Hope you have a great arrival in the US um, when that time comes. Have a good evening, everyone. Bye and thank you. Bye-bye.